Hello everybody, greetings once again from Chennai in India. Today I am going to talk about a rather rare topic in clinical medicine from its historical perspective. Who remembers the porphyrias? For most medical students and healthcare providers, the name encompasses a group of disorders that was mentioned in biochemistry lectures and presented as rare case reports in clinical meetings and considered by most of us to be too rare to commit to memory. The porphyrins are a heterogeneous group of disorders mainly inherited that are linked to the enzymatic defects in the heme biosynthetic pathway. I am only going to talk about uh, the historical snippets of these various porphyric syndromes and not about the clinical features, diagnosis, management, etc. Millions and millions of years ago, before the rays of the sun reached the planet Earth to start photosynthesis, there existed only the anaerobes and an atmosphere of ammonia, methane and water and darkness was upon the face of the Earth. A chemist, Stanley Miller, prepared a primordial soup made out of these three substances in a sealed flask and he subjected it to an electrical discharge. Presto, porphyrins were formed. So porphyrins are essential for life on this planet. Porphyrins have the ability to react with light and causing skin alterations and hence they are known as photosensitizers. This photosensitizing ability of the porphyrins was first demonstrated by Mayer Betz in 1913 when he injected himself intravenously with hematoporphyrin. Nothing serious happened except that for the next eight weeks he could not venture into sunlight without getting badly sunburned. The term porphyros is a Greek one for reddish purple, which is a color shown by hematoporphyrin in the blood when viewed under Wood's light. And this was first demonstrated by a man called Tudicum in 1967. Acute intermittent porphyria was first delineated by Jan Waldenstrom of Sweden in 1937. So it is also known as Swedish porphyria. To trace the origin of the disease, a man named Walquist went through all the baptism registers that are maintained in the churches in Sweden and he managed to trace the first case to the family of a clergyman, that is a priest, named Eric Norius who married a girl from Lapland, which is extreme uh, north of Sweden. And uh, she was probably the carrier of this gene of AIP. The children born to this couple were first detected cases of AIP in Sweden. The family name was Gelstrom. And even today, many of the porphyrics in Sweden have this surname. This type of porphyria, there are no skin lesions, only neuropsychiatric manifestations and abdominal pain. In England, the acute porphyrias were known as the royal malady since many of the kings and queens in the house of Stuart, Hanover and Prussia had signs and symptoms suggestive of AIP. The classical example was King George III of the Hanoverian dynasty. He was not a good king and had fits of madness alternating with severe depression. His father, King George II, was a bit dull and so the royal affairs were mostly run by his mother, Queen Caroline, who was very popular with the subjects. So she had very little time to spend, quality time to spend with her son, George III. Now, based on these historical facts, A. H. Crisp wrote a poem in the Royal College Proceedings, July 1995. It goes thus. George III was wont to be often somewhat grandiose, 
but also melancholy. In faith, the truth was plain to see he was a case of MDP, maniac depressive psychosis. What an awful tragedy. Could it be heredity? The Hanoverian dynasty, the very notion of the monarchy, was coming under scrutiny. The cry went up, the urine is red. This porphyrins causing him to brood and then to elevate his mood. He is not to blame. He just his chain of porphyrin molds has slipped a link, is on the blink. What a naughty little gene. But perhaps it's all he'd ever seen of his mother, oh, what a queen. So if it is king you want to be, fit to govern, nobly born, don't admit to owning feelings, shaped by life, though predetermined, love and hate are things you hide, but put your urine on the slide. The other acute porphyria with the fascinating history is variegate or mixed porphyria, popularly also known as South African porphyria, because of its prevalence in that country, nearly 8,000 cases have been reported in Cape Town itself. Much work was done on this type of porphyria by two physicians, Dean and Barnes. Dean was a GP in Cape Town. One of the patients in his panel was a nurse who used to frequently visit his surgery complaining of vague abdominal pain, depression and so on. So Dean used to prescribe barbiturates, the only available sedative at that time. It only made her worse. As to be expected, since now we know that the barbiturates are potent porphyrogenic drugs. One night, Dean was called to the emergency department of Groot Shoot Hospital, a large teaching hospital in Cape Town where Christian Barnard did his first cardiac transplant. The resident in charge told Dean that his nurse patient had swallowed a few tablets of barbiturates and had quickly slipped into coma. The bladder was catheterized and the urine was found to be red, but it was not blood. So the professor of biochemistry, Barnes, was called and he had a look at it and thought it was porphyrin. And he took it to his lab and confirmed that it was indeed porphyrin, zero porphyrin. Unfortunately, the patient died. Dean was very upset and along with Barnes, he decided to do some in-depth research in, into this porphyria. The difference between South African porphyria and the Swedish one clinically is that in the South African variety, in addition to neuropsychiatric manifestations and abdominal pain, significant photosensitivity also occurred. Now, Dean tried to trace back the origin of the mutant gene when it was first introduced into South Africa. Since there was no history of this porphyria amongst the original black population in Cape Town. He went back to the 17th century when the Dutch East India Company was well ensconced in South Africa, particularly in the diamond mining industry. The administration was by the Dutchmen, most of whom were bachelors, known locally as the Free Burgers. In the natural order of things, these bachelors cohabited with the local young black women, resulting in the birth of many mulatto children. This caused a lot of concern among the senior administrators back home. So in 1687, a committee of 17 directors was appointed in Holland to find a solution to this problem. They decided to send young women from the orphanages in Rotterdam to go and marry the free burgers in Cape Town. One of these young girls was Arianji Jacobs, who went and married the free burger giant Jans. They decided to name their children Van Ruyen. It was amongst this family that the first case of variegate porphyria was detected in South Africa. So even today, if someone in Cape Town has a photosensitive skin, he or she is said to have the Van Ruyen skin. A large kindred of porphyrix was found in Chester in England, hence it is also called the Chester porphyria. Giles Young, a young uh, consultant gastroenterologist, 
started taking an interest in this porphyria since most of the patients went to him with abdominal pain. With the help of two anesthesia registrars, Muhammad Qadir, a Palestinian, and Zerka Bakiris, Yugoslavian, the team traced the origin of the disease to a quarrelsome community of salmon fishermen on the banks of the River Dee in Chester. The first case detected was Peter Dobson, born in 1867 to a prostitute. So he took the mother's surname of Dobson. He married Sarah Pei and uh, most of the family members there had abdominal pain and psychiatric symptoms. And they used to go and present themselves to the GPs saying they had Dobson's complaint. The porphyrin profile of Chester porphyria resembles the Swedish and the South African porphyria. So a dual enzyme defect was postulated originally. But the present view is that Chester porphyria is a variant of variegate porphyria, but without the skin lesions of the latter. So far, we have only looked into the history of the acute porphyrias. Amongst the chronic hepatic porphyrias, the one with the most fascinating history is the Turkish porphyria. In the year 1955, Dr. Sihad Kamp, director of the skin clinic from eastern Turkey, started seeing an unusual number of children in the age group of 5 to 10 years with somewhat identical complaints. They all had sores on the face and on the dorsum of the hand, that is, sun exposed areas. They also had dark pigmented skin and were very, very hairy. So the locals called them monkey children. The mothers of the affected children also said that these children passed red colored urine. All affected children had hepatomegaly and were physically stunted. Detailed history revealed a further interesting finding. All the patients were from villages in Western Turkey. Every child in these villages below two years of age, breastfed by mothers, died. The infant population in these villages was simply decimated. This was not unlike what happened 2000 years earlier when King Herod ordered the slaughter of all children in Egypt below two years of age in the hope of getting rid of infant Jesus. Dr. Cam was now convinced that he was seeing a new type of porphyria in an epidemic form. So he traveled to Western Turkey with the patients and along with the local public health authorities went into an environmental history. It transpired that in the year 1954, there was famine in these villages because the wheat crops, the staple diet of these poor peasants, were destroyed by the fungus Telesia triticae. The local government was not geared to tackle this problem and so they appealed to neighboring European countries for a solution. One Western European country responded by sending a large shipment of seed wheat which had been treated with an antifungal chemical hexachlorobin C. So the fungus cannot destroy it. Unfortunately, when the shipment arrived in the villages, the starving peasants mistook this for edible wheat. They prepared bread from this chemically treated wheat, ate it, fed it to the children, and tragedy struck about six months later when those between three to ten years developed for freak signs. And as already mentioned, below those below two years who were breastfed by the mothers who had eaten this contaminated bread died. Animal experiments clearly showed that it was a hexachlorobenzene, which was the cause of these hepatic porphyries. By the time the government banned the use of this chemical, 5,000 Turkish children had been affected by this porphyry. The story doesn't end there. 20 years later, Crips et al. from the United States, they revisited these villages, went by jeep from village to village to try and trace out the original cases and they found 38 of these. All of them showed slight physical retardation, with dark complexion when compared to the peers, were still very hairy and continued to be photosensitive. 
but an additional and inexplicable finding clinically was that they all had a painless arthropathy with shortening of the fingers, which was not present in any of the other types of porphyric syndromes. The lesson that clinicians learned from this epidemic of Turkish porphyria is that one should be careful when introducing a new chemical or drug in clinical practice. It is always good to learn from past mistakes to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself. Thank you.